Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming to the Adventures in Angular podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Frost with Hero Devs. Today on the panel, we have, amazingly, Alyssa Nichols still here. Hello, hello. <laughs> and we also have as our guest, someone who I feel honored that she came today, but we have Jennifer Wadella. This episode is sponsored by Sentry.io. Recently, I came across a great tool for tracking and monitoring problems in my apps. Then I asked them if they wanted to sponsor the show and allow me to share my experience with you. Sentry provides a terrific interface for keeping track of what's going on with my app. It also tracks releases so I can tell if what I deployed makes things better or worse. They give you full stack traces and as much information as possible about the situation when the error occurred to help you track down the errors. Plus, one thing I love, you can customize the context provided by Sentry. So, if you're looking for specific information about the request, you can provide it. It automatically scrubs passwords and secure information, and you can customize the scrubbing as well. Finally, it has a user feedback system built in that you can use to get information from your users. Oh, and I also love that they support open source to the point where they actually open source Sentry if you want to self-host it. Use the code devchat at sentry.io to get two months free on Sentry's small plan. That's code devchat at sentry.io. So Jennifer, can you take a second, introduce yourself to the listeners? Do you want like 140 characters or less intro no. or do you want my life story? I, mean, I don't want, <laughs> I want somewhere in between what Alyssa did the first time oh and like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> just do like the 60 second version, yeah? Okay, 60 second version, JavaScript developer by day, community organizer the rest of the time and international speaker in between all that, crazy plant lady and kombucha brewer. Oh, that's the 20 second version. Yeah, you said kombucha. <laughs> like, how big into it do you get? Like, are you just like, eh, I passively do some. Oh, that's what you're yeah, drinking. But- nice. Yeah. This is my blood orange kombucha from a recent batch. So I did a batch of it was that. I did strawberry and I did mango. And then my mm. batch right now is um, uh, ginger, carrot, and turmeric. How do you oh. brew kombucha? Is there like, you know, the whole like with the swirling glass pipes and such? <laughs> I mean, do you want me to take my laptop? I can take you on an adventure <laughs> and show you. <laughs> I don't know. Does it look yeah. like a science lab? Like, um, No, not really. Oh. It's mostly just like I do a continuous brew system, which means I kind of have one big jar. It's a five-gallon jar that I have tea in there, and it's got my um, SCOBY, which is your symbiotic colony of yeast and bacteria. Like you put sweet tea in, and that's what ferments it um, and, and creates that kind of vinegariness. And then what I do is I drain off of there. I put them into um, like Gorlash bottles or however you pronounce them. And I do flavorings there, and that's called the 2F process, the second fermentation process. And so that's where you get, like, the carbonation if you do it correctly. Yeah. Cool. (laughs) Yes. And it's way cheaper than buying in the store. Like, it's insane. So, I love it. Oh, and also it looks like we have Joe Eames joining us. Jose. Hola. (laughs) Sorry I'm late. I was tutoring and got really involved. Come on, Joe. Come on. You're one of those good tutors. That gets involved. That gets involved. <laughs> Dang it, Joe. <laughs> Jennifer, I noticed you're wearing a SendGrid t-shirt. Oh, yeah. Was that by happenstance? Yeah. <laughs> like, Just all I fucking own are you... programmer t-shirts. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, like, my comfy one. And I thought I had the flu earlier this week. So I've pretty much been wearing this for, like, two or three days and just, like, sleeping in it. Yeah. But I think I am flu-free. So I don't know. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. You work from home? Yep. Cool. Yep. Yeah. When you said don't change for three days, I was like, oh, <laughs> that sounds like me. She must work from home. <laughs> well, and I mean, like, normally I go to the gym every day of the week. And so, like, I'll, you know, just have on crap clothes, put on my workout gear, come home, shower, and like be a presentable human being. But I've been feeling like crap. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. Been there for yep. like, the last nine months, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stupid human growing. <laughs> Oh, I wanted to mention real quick your meetups for the audience. We can wait to the end though, if you wanted. But yeah, you said that was something you do. Yes. And there's like a lot of them, like 10 or so. How many things do you um, run? It's slightly absurd. Um, <laughs> so overall, I run a nonprofit organization called Kansas City Women in Technology, which is dedicated to getting more women into technology careers in the Kansas City area. Solving the diversity issue is not like a one silver bullet like solution. So we run a variety of different programs. Um, We have kind of like uh, random meetups that are more community driven. So tomorrow morning, we've got an intersectional feminism over coffee meeting at a local coffee shop. But we do monthly tech talks, which are kind of introductory level events. So I think our topic this month is like, what is being a a project manager, a PM? And so we'll have a couple panelists talking about their jobs as PMs. And so women can kind of explore different careers in technology. 
And then what we're really known for are our coding programs. So we run a chapter of Coder Dojo, which is a global nonprofit founded out of Ireland that teaches kids K through 12 how to code. Um, We're one of the longest standing chapters. We've been running for almost, I think, five and a half years now, where we've had 100 kiddos plus a month learning how to code. Um, And so that's open to um, boys, girls, um, any child, regardless of their gender identity. We want to, you know, teach the idea of gender blindness. Anybody can code. Um, We do a ton of fun stuff there that I can go on about all day. We run another program called Coding and Cupcakes, which is geared at um, getting girls into coding, but it's actually more aimed at their parents. That looks awesome, though. (laughs) (laughs) Well, but it's not targeted at somebody like you who understands like how programming is awesome. It's targeted at parents who've made comments to us like, oh, well, my daughter wouldn't like Coder Dojo. Maybe I'll bring my son. And so it's the parents that have this notion that coding isn't appropriate for girls and are acting as a roadblock. And so Mm -hmm. what do you do? You make it get pink, you make it girly, and all of a sudden the parents are on board because it's girl-friendly. Meanwhile, I'm having, (laughs) you know, eight-year-old girls deploying websites via GitHub pages and the command line. So I don't really give a shit what color it is. You embrace (laughs) embrace the broken system in order to fix the system. I I love it. It's a pragmatic approach, though. It's 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 anarchy. I love it. I love it. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And then from there, uh, we had a lot of women who would uh, try and sign up for Coding and Cupcakes and say, well, I don't have a daughter, but I want to learn how to code. And so that was the creation of Coding and Cocktails, which is by far our most popular program. Um, wow. It's, yeah, an 11-month program uh, teaching adult women how to code. Um, obviously, the Bomber's Peak helps a lot. So we do serve cocktails and mocktails for those who don't drink. But that's, that's a really popular program. Like, we sell out at 80-plus seats a month of women wanting to learn how to code. Um, we have a really innovative presentation slash worksheet style and a ton of really amazing mentors, all women from the Kansas City area. Um, I love it. Awesome. <laughs> So, and then we also run a lot of um, like kind of annual workshops. The last three years we've done Jangle Girls, which is another nonprofit out of Europe. And then this year we will be adding NG Girls to our suite of programs. So that will be happening in July. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> is there nice. one main place people can go to see all the programs or do they just yes. find you on Twitter to like see the latest or what would yeah. you suggest? kcwomenintech.org slash events. Um, We'll have all of our different events on our calendar. You can find us on Meetup. um, You can find us on Twitter. All of our different programs have their own um, social media channels. So all sorts of stuff to get involved in there. Have you, Jen, watched... Jennifer. Jennifer, my bad. I will break kneecaps for calling me Jen. (laughs) One morning. Next time. Got it. My wife is the same way. If you call her Jenny, that's that's the end of it. Your (laughs) wife and I would get along. She's okay with Jen, though. It's Jen or Jennifer are fine, but Jenny is out. The middle ground, the Jenny she can't handle. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, and the problem is my mom is so old that her does oh, no. not, not do with names. Jenny. My mom calls her Jenny. She, no. Yep. Oh. And so it's the one place she's just like, every time she's like, <sighs> and she has to go through like the count to 10 thing. And <laughs> woosa, so, woosa. <laughs> so have you watched Into the Darkness, Star Trek Into the Darkness movie? I mean, it's not new. It's just not the old ones. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I kind of, it's going to sound weird. That's why I'm asking. I kind of want to take... <laughs> some of your blood and put it into my system just to see how awesome I could become. Cause you sound, <laughs> yeah. you sound a bit like con as far as like meta human organizing thousands of people to get better as a community. Like that's yeah, pretty awesome. What the heck Jennifer? What the heck? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think like if I can give you one piece of advice, it's you can't do everything yourself. The most important thing you can do is learn to develop leaders around you. Mm -hmm. And like, I look at the team because we've got probably about 60 people that are volunteers on our nonprofit team who are running these day-to-day programs and making them better. And I just look at the work they do. And I'm such like a proud mama. Like I don't have kids, but I can only imagine that's what that feeling is because like they have just done so much more amazing work than I ever could do as a single individual and have that kind of ripple effect is just like, Ooh, it's, it's good. And and they're so, amazing. They're way more amazing than me. And it makes me proud. It makes me happy. <laughs> so you said our, who's our, like, what is our, our nonprofit team? Who's, who's our, like, what is the group referring to? So the Kansas City Women in Technology Leadership Team. So like, according to IRS, like there's only three of us, a president, a, a secretary and a treasurer. Mm. I think that's what the IRS requires. But in all honesty, we kind of run like a, a lean startup. So we have a lot of hierarchy. So um, mm. we've got our operations director, Ventura, who manages um, our operations team, who does everything from our data and analytics to diversity and inclusion to uh Community outreach, we get hounded by a lot of requests and membership. Um, so we've got all those kind of roles that operate for Casey Wood as a whole. 
and then we've got our program director, Sarah Dutzman, who is, oversees all of our programs. Um, and so that'll be um, Coder Dojo, Coding and Cupcakes, Coding and Cocktails, Django Girls, NG Girls. And all those programs have individual teams. So all of those programs are led by a director and a co-director uh, and then have supplementary roles. So a lot of times we'll have a mentor director, somebody who fac- facilitates communication and onboarding all our new mentors for our programs. We have a curriculum director. Some of the programs have an additional worksheet director if they're um, doing monthly worksheets that go alongside the curriculum. Um, I'm trying to think some of our other roles um, that depend. Uh, for workshops, we usually have a venue director and a sponsorship director. People are responsible for managing those kind of relationships. So a fair bit of hierarchy going on to keep everything working. <laughs> yeah. I, how long ago did this all start? Like uh, February 2013? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We've evolved a lot since then. Um, I've made a lot of mistakes along the way, but I'm pretty damn proud of where we are today. Oh yeah. my gosh. And it's always been in Kansas City. It didn't uh-huh. hop. No, we've had a ton of requests to help roll out our programming in other cities. And we're still in the process of figuring out how we can do that, but to enforce our values, because I think those are really critical to our success as an organization. And especially in light of the recent events with GDI, like it's a really big concern that if we're going to put our name and our brand out there, that anybody who puts on our programming emulates our values and finding a way to control that all while being a, a team of volunteers. So yeah, you definitely inspire me. That's yeah, awesome. I'm inspired. Like <laughs> for me, I'm going to do a whole podcast about what you're doing. Cause it's pretty, I, I gotta be honest. I'm inspired. I, I do some community stuff, but that no, you're, you're like, um, <laughs> I'm kind of like putting you on a pedestal. So I'm going to stop because that's not what the show is about today. We could do another show about that. I we- do. I do have my 10 commandments of community organizing talk that I built to help people better run communities. So we oh, can do nice. that another time. Yeah. Yeah, I think we should do another episode <laughs> with Jennifer. Oh, Did you catch me? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I almost got busted knees right there. <laughs> I'll get the oh, yeah. right. and You know I'm going to see you in like about a month, so you know your kneecaps can. Uh, no, that's that's the lost. fear of that is what made me fix that. <laughs> the fear. <laughs> okay, so uh, <laughs> I don't want you to bring the same kind of passion, and everything else, into your kneecaps threat. So I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so when I reached out to Jennifer, I'm like, hey, we need the experience that you've got to come to the podcast. What do you want to talk about? And she wanted to talk about. I'm going to let Jennifer introduce the topic. So go ahead. Crap. What did I say? Um, Let's <laughs> control value access. Yes. Okay. The control value access. Just making sure. Cause like, I'm really into that and I'm really into um, reactive forms and really kind of taking an in-depth look because I feel like I hear a lot of people struggling with that. Yeah. And like, how long has the web been around? How long have we been doing like form driven, like web applications? Why is this so fucking hard? Yeah, no, so, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Right. One of the talks I give now, the one I'm doing at NGConf is kind of an iteration of it. But I think last fall sometime, I was trying to implement a type ahead in a reactive form. And I was just having this issue because I want to display, you know, one piece of data actually in the input itself and then be submitting another piece of data, like an ID or something the user doesn't give a shit about. And I couldn't figure out a way to do it with the library I was using. I'm like, it's 20 fucking 18. This shouldn't be an issue. It should not take me longer than two minutes to implement some sort of type ahead. Totally. Uh, which set me on my, my insane journey, which culminated in discovering the control value accessor and learning how to harness its power. Tell um, us more. Tell us more. <laughs> um, so like, it sounds scary, right? You're like, ooh, what could that mystery be? And really, it it's just like a way to create a custom form element. Because like the beauty of reactive forms is you don't have a lot of mess or drama, right? Like you've got the value that you're submitting and we're good to go. But that can kind of get messy if you want to display something different to the user and how to manage that. So like, let's look at a type ahead, for instance, where you have a, you have um, like drop down values that you want to select from. And let's say each of those is tied to an ID, but what you really want to show the user is like the state name or whatever. We'll use that as an example. The cool thing about the control value accessor is essentially you can create this wrapper that is going to have it act as a form element according to its parent form. And you could just submit a value, you can set validation, whether it's valid or invalid um, or required based on that. Like this component it is just displaying what you want. And then the only thing the parent knows about is that it's getting its value that you want. So instead of having to do, you know, event emitters and worry about inputs and outputs, it's just functioning as a normal form element. And once you understand how to um, implement the interface properly, because TypeScript, we've got interfaces that define what something needs to look like. Once you understand that, you can really um, quickly create your own custom form elements uh, that are pretty clean and not a lot of drama and very testable. 
Does this control value accessor have anything to do with the data that's actually being submitted or is it only controlling what's being viewed by the users? Both. Um, so you're able to, um, quote unquote, emit the value. So you can display whatever you want, get, you know, okay, let's say you tie in like a click event to something and you're doing some sort of crazy display in the UI. Whenever you're ready to submit that value, you can go ahead and just update the value and that'll update the parent form. And so if you've got dynamic validation, like maybe you're dependent on listening to a value change in this form to make something else happen, that's handled completely. So you're kind of just wrapping it in a nice, pretty way. So uh, let me ask a question, because when you pitch this idea, control value accessors, I'm like, all right, that must be a thing about in your, I don't know. Are you saying it's a, it's a component that I have to build or is it, is the CVA something that already exists out of the box in Angular? It already exists out of the box in Angular and it okay. is an interface. Okay. Can I ask, how does it relate yeah. to the form control object? So um, it's like, okay, like let's say you want to set just a regular form control that's a basic input and name. Yes. Um, and so you do that in the parent form. Uh, you would do this the same way. You would create a form control for whatever this element is. Okay. Um, and as far as the form is going to be concerned, this this component that you build, um, as long as it's implementing the control value access or interface, is going to oh, act exactly like a form control. Oh, so... I didn't think about how hard this would be without like visuals to use. No, no, no. So I, I just said, is it this or that? It's both. So it is a component I have to build, but it's implementing a component interface. Yep. Oh, I got you. Okay. So it is a component we're going to make. Yes. But, but it, has to, it has to match an API. So it's implementing something, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, it's, inter okay. it's implementing what is called the control value access or interface. Um, oh. And so there, yeah. So there are three uh, required methods on that. Write value, which is going to, you know, write the value to the parent form. And then register on change and register on, on touched, which is what we care about with validation, right? Because oh. sometimes you'll want to show validation if a form element has been touched, if it's been changed, all sorts of scenarios. And does it take a form control as an input? Uh, how does it form control? Does it instantiate so, as form control or how, what, does it, what does it do? So you basically kind of bind it the same way. Like, okay, let's say you have a component, right? Yeah. Um, and you've called it my special component. Yeah. Um, you literally just put the form control name and then the name value in there. And that's how you bind it to the form. It's so mm. clean. Oh, like wow. it's pretty sexy. Like, how do you, how do you notify it of its parent form? <clears throat> Does it take a form as an input or no? Because it's it's dumb, right? Oh, like it doesn't yeah, need to yeah. know about its parent form. Yeah, and so and I talk about this, you know, when I'm explaining the concept is you want to keep these controls really dumb because it's just acting as an input essentially, right? And you want to leave yeah. all the logic and validation and everything to the parent form as long as you can hook into unchanged and untouched and what the value is, um, that kind of thing. Got you. Oh, yes. so you know what? I wish I, <laughs> I built um, a really nice form system and I made my own component like this, but it didn't implement this interface. And so, <laughs> so I had, you... well, I had a couple difficulties that I, I was able to easily work around, but I'm guessing I wouldn't have run into that if I had known about the CVA interface, because it sounds like it's, it's way, way nice when you have that. Yeah, it's like, it's just so clean and so beautiful. Like I wish I could show everybody right now, but I know it's, it's the so problem with people know about it. Podcast. <laughs> I know, and so few, few people know about it. I'm like, everybody has to know this amazing thing that will make your life so much better. And they're like, okay, yeah, whatever, Jennifer. Like, calm down, cool your tits. Oh, wow, yeah, yeah. Man, this is great. This is yes. awesome. I didn't know that was a thing. I mean, I knew that I loved reactive forms. And I knew that, like, right? um, of the many things I totally agree with Ward Bell on, I disagreed with him on the reactive forms. Thing. He hates them, but I'm like, no, I love them. They're still fantastic. The mm. validation is amazing. Mm -hmm. How they all relate is amazing. Being able to optionally toggle new, new controls in and out is mm -hmm. amazing. But I had built my own pieces that sounds like the CVA already covers. So this is great. Mm -hmm. So... Yeah. One of the things you can't do is too much is like over communicate. So the control value accessor, is that something that I use if I'm just building just a plain form or only for when I'm building my own custom type stuff and like trying to implement like what Aaron was talking about? I mean, there are a couple of different scenarios. Like let's say you've got several checkboxes that appear in various forms throughout your application. It might make sense to go ahead and wrap those in a custom element, implementing the control value accessor to handle that kind of situation. Okay. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I guess w another way to state this question is, what things would I be doing in an app and think to myself, 
ooh, I should know what the control value accessor is and the benefits that it's bringing. If, if I'm just doing like a login box, do I care? Probably and if I'm doing not. a huge, crazy five-page wizard with, you know, so many input controls of every possible kind and, and gazillion different states, then do I care? Possibly on the wizard, like a basic login, unless something insane was going on, which I really can't think of off the top of my head, but like... I still see people with AOL addresses, so anything can happen. Um, <laughs> sorry, I was kind of bitchy. Um, <laughs> They're like, hey, I have AOL, but take me serious. <laughs> oh, sweetie. Oh, sweetie. Uh, <laughs> from Hashtag my, my dad. Third. Sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. My dad got his LinkedIn hacked a couple weeks ago and like had a meltdown, and I thought it was the funniest no. thing in the world. <laughs> my dad is with AOL. That's so funny you called that. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway, sorry um, I interrupted you. But for a more complicated wizard, I think if you're finding yourself repeating a lot of elements that you want to ha- like um, handle in a similar way, it might make sense to go ahead and wrap them in a custom component that emits like one one value. So, and I use checkboxes because I figure I feel like checkboxes are one of those like obnoxious things where there's the way checkboxes are supposed to work and it doesn't normally line up with how we're actually like submitting data into an API. And so I feel like this is a case where you can kind of wrap that, make it a little bit prettier and kind of not like cry yourself to sleep at night over your ugly code. Hey, are you working on a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. They update the class regularly for the most current Angular, and a lot of the curriculum is also relevant to older versions. Or you can go beyond the three-day class with help from Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. They can assist your team or launch your project, including scalability, data flow, state management, service architecture, full-stack product design, and a ton more. Or you can contact them for a private class at your location or attend public classes in cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. So this is still about when I am going to create like a custom component or control that's going to group up multiple things. That's when this comes in. If I'm just throwing basic plain controls on a form and not trying to group them together. Now, granted, I may sh- maybe I should be grouping them together like is what you're talking about. And I should be doing something custom. So I would say it depends on the data you're trying to submit. Like if you've got a key and a value, right? And you just care about what that value is going to be, but it might be gathering from a couple different UI elements. That's where the control value accessor would be powerful is when you want more granular control over that. And so the problem is you can do this without it, but you don't realize how much painful, how much more painful it is. Especially if your name's Frosty. (laughs) (laughs) Sorry, I'm just gonna <laughs> make it out. Zoom high five. Zoom high five. <laughs> yes. like, that's the thing. I like how I discovered this is I was like, you can make it happen, but I was like, I feel so dirty writing this. There's got to be a better way. So is this always centered around multiple controls that are grouped together? If I, I've, I've no. got multiple. No. Oh, no. okay. I mean, like my rule of thumb of when you should consider if using the control value accessor might be a better option is. Are you having difficulties with what you want to display in the UI versus the data you want to submit? I think that could be a okay. good rule of thumb. About mapping the state to the, to the visual display using input controls. Yes. Yeah. So if you want kind of like separation of those, meaning like showing one thing but submitting another. All right. I think I'm, I think I'm getting it. If, if I play super dumb, which was just totally an act, it's 100% an act, <laughs> then hopefully... No, it's, they're good questions though, because like, right. yeah. Joe, no, it's, you're it's not totally not an act. This is this is an act. <laughs> I was like, you asking, this I was like, I'm really confused now if it's an act or not. And it's I'm just... not an act. It's not an act. No, no, no. Like, I'm definitely approaching this from the. All right, explain it down to me. You, have you seen what was it where he says, uh, I don't know, some show. It's Michael Scott. Like, like I'm in, yeah. Tell me like I'm in third grade, and then he tells him he's like, okay, <laughs> tell me like I'm in first grade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. I think we hit the first grade level finally. I'm, I think I'm starting to get the concept of this, and makes me excited for your talk as well at EduConf. Good, because um, I got some good jokes in there too. Good. So I have a question. Um, I'm gonna try and unjail this and bring it back up a notch. So did that? Did you just coin that phrase? Are we as unjail now become a un-Joe? thing? And Joe. I don't know, it might be. I mean, it might be. I think it's a thing. We'll have to see on Twitter when the episode goes out. We're in that shit right now. If you are listening to this, you definitely need to tweet hashtag unjo. Unjo. <laughs> yes. Let's, let's, oh, okay. let's see if we can make that. And how are you going to unjo it? Yeah. <laughs> so when you're dealing with forms and you're doing a lot of forms, one of the cool things I found out reactive was 
I just needed to make an array of these objects that represent a control that was going to go on the page. Mm -hmm. And then I give that array to an NG4 and then it's like, bam. Magic. Yeah. And here's all these things. So Mm -hmm. this control value accessors for that purpose, right? Or no, I'm not, I'm not getting, I just want to make sure like, is the, is the CVA component that I am building, is it supposed to be capable of getting the object from me and then going, oh, I know how to make this type of a component. I know how to make this type of a form input or select box or radio or text area. Because uh, that's kind of what I did. So I'm, I'm trying to relate the form array that we all make, the, the, yep. the list of, of fields we want yep. to, to the CVA. How do, they, how do they relate? What does the CVA know how to do? The CVA component? Well, okay. First, I guess, explain to me in that scenario, like let's say you have an array of things, how would you differentiate between creating an input versus a select? So let's say I have a a field on this array of objects and it's like type and one type is input and the other type, or one type is text and one Mm -hmm. type is select. Okay. So, and again, maybe I'm doing it wrong. I'm trying to figure out how does the CVA component take this array that represents my, and maybe the array came from the database. Maybe I have it hard coded, but how does it represent that? I'm just trying to figure out the relationships. Okay. Sorry. My brain was like thinking you were in a different direction with that. Okay. Oh no. So like, are you saying like, if you have an array of values like to display? No, like I have an array of objects and the first thing is like name, first name, type, text. Okay. And maybe a couple validation rules. I don't know. Okay. And I give that to the control value accessor or whatever. I don't know. Like I'm asking, is that how it works? Or what is my model going to look like when I'm using the CVA, the control value accessor component? That's what I'm trying to understand. So the, the best way to think of it is like if you create a, a custom component that is implementing the control value accessor interfa- interface, it's going to be almost the exact same conceptually as like your text input or your select box. Does that make sense? So, so so the template is very plain. Well, so the template, you can put whatever you want in there. Like you can put a slideshow in there for all I care. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. So that is what I mean by like having the really granular control of whatever you display to the UI and then having the complete control of, okay, whenever you're ready to submit a value back up to the form is when you call your right value, which is going to register that value to the parent form. Okay. I feel like that was really awkward and circular. No, I think it's good. Like, maybe I'm lazy. I don't know if I'm lazy or smart. Maybe both. Maybe both. both. <laughs> All um, good programmers are lazy. So if I, like, wanted an, an input in a text area in a select box, I would make an array with, like, first name, text, and then type as text, and then another object that's, like, text area, like, bio, and mm-hmm. then type is text area, and then the last one could be bruise kombucha type select, right? Nice. And I want to just say... I want to give that array of objects to something that spits out a form. Is gotcha. That, is that not how it works? Like, do I need to make a CVA for select lists and a CVA for text areas and another CVA for... Uh, yeah, because you are controlling what's displaying in the markup. Okay, so you are making you are implementing the CVA I- interface mm-hmm. on several different form mm-hmm. control components is what you're saying. Or... I'm just trying to understand. Sorry. Um, Okay. So let's go back to um, like, let's say you've got a third party type ahead you're doing. Okay. Yep. And I feel like a lot of people are familiar that you normally, you have your input element and then you might have a bunch of stuff in there, like type ahead and where your data source is coming from, or like type ahead on select and some sort of on select event or on blur event. Like, does that sound familiar? Yeah. So if I'm creating um, a a component that implements a control value access or interface, that's going to be my, that code is going to be in my template for this. Mm. And so that means I can do whatever I want with that. And the parent form is completely unaware until I call write value, which is a method um, of the control value interface, in which case, whatever I want to have happen, like setting a value of maybe whatever the user selected in that type of head is then going to be um, passed up to the parent form. Okay. I got it. Yeah. You completed the circle for me. I get it. I understand. Sweet. Um, okay. I understand how this fits in. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't have any more questions. That was my main question. Um, okay. No, no, I do have another question. Sorry. When you and Alyssa were talking earlier, I was like, okay, um, this is awesome. Now, is there an equivalent interface for the form group itself? Cause like, I see this as like an interface to make a component <laughs> for the form control. Is there 
there might not be one like, but you have your form group as well. Is yeah. there like another interface for you to program form groups? Probably not because they don't have the same issues. Like, yeah, like I guess I don't see why that would need it be needed because okay. a form group is just like you know a collection of controls. Yeah, and so the CVA is meant to be at that granular level. Um, yeah, so there's not like I just asking because I, I didn't know this existed, so I was like, the <laughs> other one. So, yeah. That makes sense. like what is possible. Yeah, <laughs> anything is possible. What is the matrix? So yeah, I just was wondering. So yeah, this is cool. Like, um, you know, I think when I when I first do- dove into reactive forms the first time, I was confused because I had an array, a JSON array of things that came from the database. Mm-hmm. We need to gather this info from the user. Yep, and it needed to be driven from the database because. We didn't yep. want to have to re-release the app every time we want to. I was like, okay, cool, 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 cool. Mm-hmm. And then I was like, okay, so I have this array of objects. Mm-hmm. And now I need to make another array of thing, a, a thing called a form control. Mm-hmm. I was like, okay, so now I have two arrays and they have to be related. I'm like, mm-hmm. all, right, all right, all right, all right. And then I needed to make another equivalent one of each of those into the template as well. I was like, so now I got three things that yep. all represent the same. I was like, so it was really a lot for me to put into the model in my head and like go, I gotta have three of everything for every one value I'm trying to scrape out of the out of the format. And it was very difficult. Mm-hmm. And this CVA thing that I built, which is I did my own without the CVA race, but I yeah. should have used like it was nice because I didn't need all three anymore. I, at that point, all I needed was two of the three and it was mm-hmm. way easier for me to grok. So mm-hmm. I love that, that it was already existing in Angular and I'm stupid and missed it. But I love that there's a way for people to get only, you're down to two now instead of three. So this is beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm glad that you're teaching about this because- yes. like, Let me spread the word of the cult yeah. of the CDA. <laughs> no, I think, I think it's great. It, it, it simplified the reactive forms stuff once mm-hmm. I learned how to do this. So- this is fantastic topic to to get big and talk about because I think most people get to reactive forms and they're like brain exploded, I'm out, going back to template driven forms. Yep. So. But I mean like reactive forms really shine, especially for any time you're trying to do custom form stuff like the thing you were talking about. Or one of the cases I see a lot that people struggle with are like let's say they want a user to be able to add more form groups that might have like a name and an amount value or something like that. And that's something that just like you do it with reactive forms and you're like, I can code anything. I poop rainbows. That's how amazing this is. Yeah, it is nice. And it's fast too. Like Mm -hmm. it's fast. Sorry. It's runtime fast, but it's also uh, development time fast. It's easy to build. And you don't necessarily look at it and cry. Well, okay. If you're like new to reactive forms, you might look at this and be like, mommy help. But yeah. I think once you get once you get into it a little bit, there is there. So to your point, there's some mental heavy lifting right to get mm-hmm. over the barrier. But I think once you get it, you're like, man, because because once you get the first one, now it's time to go create your second form, and that second form is just like it just appeared. The first mm-hmm. one, okay, yeah, it took me a second to set up the first one, mm-hmm. but that third, fourth, fifth form, they just appear on the screen in minutes, and so yeah, it. It's fantastic. This um, on that note of learning reactive forms, I do have a pro tip for users because you might see something in online code examples. Make sure you understand what form builder is and how it is different because you can get hung up really easily if you don't understand when you see that in code sample, the difference between doing that or doing it like the manual way. So I never have used form builder. So let me ask as someone oh. who knows forms but doesn't know form builder, is form builder recommended or is it not as good? Sorry. Uh, no, I mean, it's just like, it's syntactic sugar. It's a faster way. So instead of doing new control every time and then populating, it's just shorthand for that. Um, so okay. you just write less code. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So it's the same thing. There's not like disadvantage or advantages. The advantage no. is it's easier to read. Um, right. Easier to write. I think it's easier to write. I, I don't think there's really that much readability difference. Um, I, I mean, maybe to some people, but like, if you're talking just saving keystrokes, right? You don't have to like for every um, new form control, write new form control. When you use form builder, it's going to assume, hey, I bet this bitch is writing a form control. I'm just going to do the heavy lifting for her. So, oh, yeah. yeah. I saw it and didn't use it. So I was like, that's actually easier to read. And it didn't force me to understand form group and form control. I just had to understand form builder. So it mm-hmm. seemed easier to like to, to read 
And I was like, yeah, it should be easier to build. I just didn't know. Sometimes you lose control, some granular control, but you're saying you don't use any granular control over the form at all. Okay, gotcha. Mm -mm. Yep, you can pass in everything you need just like you would um, do with the new control syntax. Okay. So in your app, and, you know, Joe, Alyssa, cut me out if I'm bogarting because I'm kind of being selfish, like learning right now. And I apologize. <laughs> Not I, fake I, learning I, like some people. I just don't know what bogarting means. So uh, Humphrey that. bogarting. Okay. So. <laughs> oh, hogging. <laughs> yeah, I'm hogging the mic is what it means. Uh, so let's say I want an input control, an input, a form control that's like, the, the autocomplete that you're talking about, right? Like yep. Some really nice control that's not just a stupid, ugly select box from the browser, right? Yep. And um, I want some text inputs to some text areas. Am I making a component that implements the CVA interface for each one of those types of form controls? I don't think so, unless, again, you need to do something different with what you're displaying to the user versus the value you want to submit to your reactive form. Okay. So does that mean that the CVA component knows how to say, oh, this is a text area, so I show this part of the template, or this is, a, this is an input, so I show this part of the template. Like, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to understand how do I get different appearing ones. Like, sorry. Gotcha. Um, mm. So, I mean, if, if you have a component that's implementing the control value accessor interface, you can treat it like a regular old component. You can pass in whatever props you want. Okay. And so, like, let's say, okay, I want to write, like, one CVA um, component to rule them all. It can handle this. It can handle this. And it can handle this. You can just pass in props like you would normally and then render different templates based on. So, NG, if you, NG if your way through the different types that you need. Mm-hmm. Oh, beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay. This I mean, yeah, there's, there's nothing magical brilliant. going on. Yeah, except for the fact that you don't have to, you know, emit events or take inputs or anything like that. You can just propagate it to the form both ways. Brilliant. Yep. Brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like you just told me everything I wanted to hear, so I'm really happy about it. But um, that was uh, awesome. Yeah, it's just yeah. I, I'm I'm here to share the glory. So, um, if anyone has any questions about this kind of stuff, are you open to like messages on Twitter, or are you like, hey, go donate to my Twitch account and? <laughs> Pop online and do a thing. I do not have a Twitch account, but one of my friends has been trying to set me or talk me into setting one up just to like stream my kombucha brewing. Yeah. Which is oh. hilarious because it's just a fucking jar that sits there. And so be, yeah. <laughs> which is why it would be funny. Um, yeah. Such action. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you can hit me up on Twitter at like OMG It's Fetty. Yeah, that's at cool. like OMG It's Friday or what? what is it? Fetty. Freddy. Okay, so Fetty. F -E -D -A -Y. Okay, so like you, how we were talking about my gamer tag earlier, PMS Fedeiken. Yeah. So like the cool kid thing, like back in the Halo Two Pro days, is like everybody would find out about the pros like regular accounts, and so the pros would make all the accounts. They'd be like, like OMG, it's Ogre One, or like OMG, the real Ogre One. And so <laughs> my, my Twitter handle is a throwback from from those days. Oh, got you, got you, got you. Nerd. 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 <laughs> <laughs> so my main question is. Why is tomorrow's meetup at 7.30 a.m.? <laughs> um, yeah. Totally going to try to be there, but what the fudge, man? I'm sorry. Yeah, it was Ow. just like a lot of people's work days, like we're I trying to accommodate Jesus. different schedules. I know. Everyone's adulting but me. I got to figure it out, Jennifer. It'll, it'll be okay, I promise. <laughs> oh, no. Thank you so much, though, for coming on and explaining this. And yeah. I, I'm super excited to see... The version with visuals. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Instead of my awkward waving hands like, trying to explain things. No, I thought I thought you did amazing. Um, I always, I have a pain for guests on this podcast because you can always tell sometimes you're like, if I could only just show you one line of code, just right. one line, right? So I thought I like you, you could turn it into like a competition or something. Yeah. Like, I got to be honest. I was, when you told me, I want to talk about this. I was like, man, I don't even know what that is. <laughs> But if people knew anything about forms, they would do it the way I'm doing it, is all I'm saying. <laughs> oh, but I don't even know what Jennifer wants to talk I about. I don't even know what that so, is. So I come onto this show, and Jennifer's like, no, 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 no. The way you do it is stupid, because there's a better way to do the exact same thing that's easier. I'm like, oh. So I actually, I'm super pumped about this. I'm glad you shared. I'm glad that you're, you're actually teaching about this a lot anymore, and I'm glad that you're out talking about it, because this is, I mean, in my opinion, if you're listening, like, 
this is a really important skill for Angular developers to master. And I think it, it can take you from kind of that good level of Angular to the great level of doing Angular with forms. And so I think if you aren't familiar with this interface and how to kind of implement one of these, go out, find Jennifer online, go out, go to the Angular documentation and find this because it really does simplify forms in Angular. Oh no, don't look at the Angular documentation on it. It's <laughs> terrible. Don't she look does. at the Angular documentation. Really? Sorry, about it. sorry. Like, <laughs> I have blogs about it. Other people have blogs about it. Don't read their documentation. You'll just be like, <laughs> what is this and why should I give a shit? We, yeah. we do have a link from a blog she wrote, Jennifer wrote. Yeah. So that Check will be in the show notes. notes. Yeah, yeah. It, she's, got a, she's got a blog, uh, a post up about it. So it's kind of an intro level blog. So if a lot of this went over your head and you're listening, this blog is an intro. Do not be you. discouraged. Go check it out. Yeah. There's hope. <laughs> yeah. Well, this is cool. Uh, so we're going to wrap it up. Is there anything else that um, that you would like to talk about? Before we finish, is there anything we didn't get to say today or what do you think? I would like to say anybody listening to this and thinking it's way over the head, don't worry. It's not as hard as um, learning RxJS, so it'll be okay. (laughs) And don't feel bad about yourself. Everybody learns at different speeds. All that matters is that you keep trying and we treat each other with kindness and respect. Beautiful. Okay. Um, Best show ever. Unless you call me Jen and then I break your kneecaps. (laughs) And you got the bat in your kneecaps. Um, (laughs) I think it's gonna happen. I think it's gonna happen one day, Wait, and I hope. I'm you there. think somebody's gonna call her Jen, or you think she's gonna have a bat? No, both. I mean, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, I'm going steel toe no boots. Think your way through that, Alyssa. Think your way through it. That would happen. Okay, Joe. Did you have anything else you want to add, or should we go to picks? No, nah, let's go picks. This episode is brought to you by Triple Byte. Applying to programming jobs sucks. You have to put the right keywords in your resume. You spend hours and hours on the phone screens and take home projects. And that's assuming the company even responds to your application. Well, if you're a software engineer, Triple Byte can help. They work with over 400 top tech companies from big names like Dropbox and Adobe to exciting startups. You do one brief online interview with them. And if you do well, you go straight to final interviews with the company on their platform. It's like the common app for software developers. Triple Byte does not look at your resume or where you went to school. All they care about is if you can code. I've helped dozens of software developers with various credentials get jobs, and this looks like a terrific way for you to get in and get interviewed and get a job without a lot of the hassle and overhead. You can go check them out at triplebyte.com slash angular. That's triplebyte.com, byte as in eight bits. As a special offer for listeners of this show, if you take a job through Triple Byte, they'll offer you a $1,000 signing bonus. Picks. Uh, Alyssa, you want to go with picks? You got your picks ready or should I go first? You should go first. I'm going to go first just because I hate, <laughs> I, hate, I hate when I force someone to be first or when I'm forced to be first, but I actually have picks today. So I'm going to go on picks first. So um, I'm going to pick, uh, I'm going in like an hour. I have to be downtown Salt Lake City at the Tesla dealership. What? You're getting one of those new so cars? I'm going to pick up a Model 3. Um, I'm just, I'm just going to pick it. I'm picking it because I'm pretty excited about it. So that's my one pick. That's not the SUV. No, it's the it's the smaller sedan okay. car. Pretty cool, though. And then the second pick is something. It kind of kind of happened this week, and it was, um, it was big, and it was disturbing for a lot of people. But it made me reflect on kind of some community things I really appreciate. Sometimes people need a, a safe space to learn. And we make mistakes. And sometimes they're big mistakes and they're ugly. And, um, and maybe we're ignorant to how ugly they were. But we have friends that are like, hey, step into this safe space with me and let me teach you about what you just did. And I make mistakes a lot. I do. And um, more than I wish I did. And those mistakes can be scary if you don't have a, fr- a friend that will invite you to a safe space to talk about it. And so I just wanted to pick, my pick is safe spaces and friends who will pull you into a safe space and teach you when you made a mistake. I've had opportunities recently to, you know, say something and then a friend be like, Oi, uh, the thing, there's a better way to say the thing. Okay. Yeah. And, and then, and you, you, you gotta go forward and hopefully not make that mistake again. But um, I just want to pick safe spaces and people who, who help out and create a safe space for people who are making mistakes uh, that are, you know, whether innocent or intentionally ugly, I, I just wanted to pick safe spaces and people who make them. So, so yeah, that's my pick. Uh, let's go to Joe. You ready? So I want to pick a board game. I pick a lot of board games. So I'm going to pick another, another board game. I played a uh, little single player game called uh, D6 Deep Space. What? It's a single player board game. 
What? It has nothing to do with Deep Space Nine, by the way. So it's like an app on your phone, but there's no, no phone? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just you and yourself, I just played it again. Yeah. You got it. It is. It's like an app. I should have explained it that way. I don't know why I tried to explain it any other way. Yeah. It's an app on your phone, except you don't there's have your phone. phone. So there's no phone, <laughs> right? Like, imagine you're playing an app on your phone, but you don't have your phone with you. Okay. Right. I mean, or it's in your yeah. An it's analog like game. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. It's a, it's an analog app. <laughs> yeah. It's an analog app. Yeah. Analog app. <laughs> yeah. So that was a, that was actually a pretty interesting little board game. D6 what? D6? D6 Deep Space deep or Deep Space. Space D6. One or the other. Hmm. I'm going to Google it and make sure that I was, that, that'll come up. Yes. If you Google Deep Space D6, comes right up. That's the first result. Board game. It's an, app, it's an app that you play without your phone. And that's pretty fun. Cool. Uh, there we Lisa? go. Uh, mine is just kind of an announcement. That's not really an announcement because I already talked about it on Twitter. But I am 38 weeks pregnant this Hello. week. And so... Any day now really is what I'm hearing. Um, so I just wanted to say I might be gone for a couple weeks, but there will be a little one that comes back with me. So it'll all be worth it. Uh, and I have no idea when that is. So, you know, we're kind of all just like one day I'll just be gone forever. No, I'm kidding. So, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give everybody a heads up about that. And thank you all for the fun shows we've been having lately. It makes me really sad. I don't want to go. So there's that. Uh, not really a pig, more of a, what is it called when you're like giving the word, spreading the word? No, anyway. there, there was a pick somewhere in there. <laughs> All right. What do you guys have? Who else hasn't gone? You both went, right? Jennifer, mm -hmm. you have some picks for us? Definitely going to say I'm digging this uh, blood orange kombucha. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the kombucha. The blood orange kombucha. I don't know. What, what should I pick? I'm trying to think. Yeah, you pick any like book songs movie something mm. code, blog post person anything that's been like your jam recently um well i just rewatched expanse season three on amazon prime and if you have not seen the expanse Ooh. it is the best damn sci-fi show like and i'm i'm sci-fi nerd right it has dethroned both Battlestar galactica and firefly for me it is based what? on a book series by, wow. by james comey that is it's, a big statement so good <laughs> oh my gosh it's it's just fantastic um all three seasons are available on amazon prime right now are they like still coming out or is it just going to be the three um they haven't set the release date but they're saying season four will be out sometime in 2019 rumors are like after july okay so, it's so we'll have that to look forward to and stranger things <laughs> yes but yes i'm in love with amos so i will just throw that out there like all the feels <laughs> you'd also mentioned the first three books of dune right Oh, I just yeah, to make that's, sure I got that. That for right. That was not necessarily a pick. That's old. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the reference to my like my Twitter handle and my gamer tag or the Fed Icon where the Fremen Warriors uh train in that book series. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Well, it's been a great episode. Thanks for coming on, Jennifer. Um Thanks for having me. If anyone wants to reach out to you one more time, your your Twitter handle? At L I K E O M G I T S F E D A Y. Okay, perfect. I have to totally. spell it out for people a lot. <laughs> <laughs> totally linking it in the show notes. <laughs> yeah. Make it easy on people. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. And uh, until next time, we'll, we'll catch you later. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.